Before we start today's video, we want to tell you about a story that appears in a video on our other channel, Paranormally Listed. It's about a person named the Mad Gasser of Mattoon. In the mid-1940s, there was a series of gas attacks in Mattoon, Illinois. One witness saw an individual wearing a gas mask near one of the scenes of attack. While there were no other clues to the person's identity, the case has never been solved. You can learn more about this case in our video, Three Bizarre Unexplained Attacks. We'll have a link to that video at the end of this video. In today's video, we'll look at relatives of celebrities who have killed people. When I think of celebrities, I always think that their homes and cars must smell amazing. That brings us to today's sponsor, Drift. I love the company Scentbird, so I'm excited to talk about their sister company, Drift, who's sponsoring this video. Drift makes beautiful air care products for your home and your car. Drift is the one-stop shop to make your home and car smell great. For your car, they have a stone freshener, a wood freshener, and a metal freshener. If you want to make your home smell amazing, they have candles, reeds, and home sprays. Everything they use is sustainable, and the scents are made with natural, essential, and fragrance oils. I was lucky enough for Drift to send me a wood freshener, and it smells amazing. I got this month's limited edition scent, which is called Fireplace. It has a light smoky smell, and it invokes the memories of sitting around a fireplace when I was a kid and drinking hot chocolate. I can almost hear the pops and crackles in the fireplace as I smell it. What's great about their car fresheners is you can get a monthly subscription. They start with a clip and a scent and then you change it every 30 days. I already mentioned that I got the scent of the month for December and it smells awesome. They have a new limited edition scent every month that's inspired by the season. They are great for stirring up memories and emotions. It's also nice to change the fragrance every month because nose blindness is a real thing. Drift subscriptions are awesome because they are flexible. It's no problem if you want to change your scent choice or your delivery frequency or just cancel. Drift has a great deal for criminally listed viewers. Use the promo code CL55 to get 55% off your first month at drift.co. Thank you Drift for partnering with me on this video. Check out the link below. Number 3. Chan Arden Jan Arden Ann Richards was born in Calgary, Alberta, but grew up in Springbank, Alberta. Her father was a construction contractor, and her mother was a dental assistant. She has an older and younger brother, Teray and Patrick. After high school, Jan played in several bar bands. In 1985, she was discovered by a manager who helped her develop her adult contemporary sound. Six years later, in 1991, she signed with A&M Island slash Motown Records of Canada. In 1993, she released her debut album, Time for Mercy. It was a hit in Canada, and it was certified platinum. Chan's biggest success came in 1994 with the release of her album, Living Under June. It featured the singles, I Could Be Your Girl and Insensitive. Insensitive was a big hit, reaching number 1 in Canada and Australia, and number 12 on the Billboard Hot 200 in the United States. Living Under June went 5 times platinum in Canada, and was certified gold in the United States. Jan Arden continued to release albums, and had success in her native Canada. From her 8 albums, she had 17 top 10 singles. She also wrote and recorded the theme song, Run Like Mad, for the international broadcast of Dawson's Creek. When Netflix acquired Dawson's Creek, Jan's song was used instead of Paula's Cole, I Don't Wanna Wait, because it was too expensive to license. The DVDs also used Run Like Mad in seasons 3 to 6. But, music-wise, Jan never found the same success outside of Canada as she did with her single, Insensitive. In 2006, she received a star on the Canadian Walk of Fame. In 2017, she was appointed a member of the Order of Canada. Jan Arden has also done some acting. She's appeared on the television shows How Long Wheels, The Detour, Working Moms, and Winona Herb, amongst others. In 2019, Jan Arden starred in a sitcom a fictionalized version of her life called Jan. In the show, she hopes to outdo her rival, Sarah McLaughlin. 
So far, there have been three seasons in the Christmas special of Jan. The show has included guest stars like Michael Bublé, Katie Lang, Brian Adams, and Sarah McLaughlin. Before Jan Arden launched her career, her family experienced an incredible hardship. Creston is a small town in southeast British Columbia. In 1992, it had a population of about 4,200 people. 21-year-old Carrie Marshall lived there with her 4-year-old son and her partner, Stan Pollock. But in summer 1992, they were preparing to move over 90 miles away to the hamlet of Tata Creek. They wanted to move away to help Pollock with his sobriety. Pollock was involved with the drug trade. Just before they moved, Marshall, her son, and Pollock were temporarily living in a shack outside of Creston. On December 3rd, 1992, Marshall's friend drove her to the shack. There were two sets of tire tracks in the fresh snow, and Marshall noted to her friend that someone had recently been there. Her friend left her alone at the shack at about 5 p.m. After that, Carrie Marshall disappeared, and she was reported missing the next day. Three days later, some clothing was found on a logging road about a 10 minute drive from the shack. The clothes led to the dead body of 21 year old Carrie Marshall. She was lying spread eagle and was naked, except for a single pink sock. The body didn't show any signs of self defense. The medical examiners thought that the murder was sexually motivated. It's believed that she was punched into unconsciousness and then raped. She had internal injuries and bled to death. The murder weapon was never found, but the medical examiner thought she was killed with a tire iron. She was beaten with the weapon while she was still unconscious. The police had a suspect, even while Marshall was just missing. That was 33-year-old DeRay Richards, the older brother of Jan Arden. DeRay had recently moved to Creston. He had to spend his weekends in a local jail as part of a sentence for threatening a woman in Alberta. DeRay had a history of violence against women. In one case, he brought a sex worker back to a hotel room. He strangled her and then sexually assaulted her. The police could also connect DeRay to Marshall. They met about two or three months after DeRay moved to Creston at a friend's home. On a Friday night, DeRay had dropped off his car at his friend's home before going to jail for the weekend. Apparently that evening, DeRay kept watching Marshall. DeRay was back at his friend's house the following Monday and Marshall was there again. This time, DeRay was drunk. He asked Marshall to go four-wheeling with him, and she turned him down. DeRay then said, What's the matter? Are you scared to go for a ride with me? Are you scared I'm going to rape you? Marshall said, No, that's not it. DeRay then responded, Well, you should be. Marshall then replied, Are you telling me I should be afraid of you? DeRay replied, No, that's not what I meant. Also, there were distinctive tire marks in the snow outside the shack. The police had someone compare the tracks to the treads on DeRay's car, and he said it was a match. Close to the shack was a preservative-treated red western cedar telephone pole. It had recently been struck by a car. DeRay's car had damage on the right rear end corner with paint on it. The paint was matched to the paint on the pole. There was also a sliver of untreated red western cedar under his bumper. The police searched DeRay's car and found two drops of blood. DNA testing was done and an expert said that the blood was from the same genotype as Carrie Marshall. However, it wasn't an exact match. One in twelve people have the same genotype. Found near the body was an empty Luby Lube motor oil can without a cap. That type of oil wasn't common in British Columbia but DeRay had several bottles in his car. 
When the police searched the car, one notable item that they didn't find was the tire iron. The police interviewed the man who sold the car to DeRay, and he said that there was a tire iron in the car when he sold it. However, the prosecution never found any definitive evidence that connected DeRay to the murder. They found what they called 41 threads of evidence that, when stitched together, made a strong fabric that proved he was guilty. So DeRay was charged with Carrie Marshall's murder. After he was arrested, the police in Calgary investigated him regarding the unsolved murders of several sex workers that happened while he was living in Calgary. However, only one of those victims was named Tracy Mauder. In October 1992, Mauder was 26 years old and a single mother. She had recently been diagnosed with cancer. She turned to sex work to make money for plane tickets so her sons could stay with her parents while she was getting treatment. She was last seen alive on October 28, 1992. Her body was found three days later in a grassy field. She had been beaten and stabbed to death. The police did not charge Sheree in Maunder's murder, but they did say he remained a viable suspect in three unsolved murders of sex workers in Calgary. They did not clarify if that included Maunder's murder or if he was cleared in that case. It's believed that a serial killer was preying on women, mostly sex workers, in Calgary in the early 1990s. We'll cover that case in our next Unsolved Serial Murders video, which will release in early 2023. Nevertheless, DeRay Richards went to trial in the spring of 1994 for the murder of Carrie Marshall. This trial lasted 74 days and the jury deliberated for 16 hours. A jailhouse informant testified. He said that DeRay had confessed to him. He said that DeRay told him that Marshall was his girlfriend. They went out to the woods and had sex on the hood of his car. He then hit her and walked away. DeRay was found guilty and he was sentenced to 25 years to life. DeRay always maintained that he was innocent. He appealed his case in 1997, and he lost. He planned to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada, but they refused to grant him an extension of time to apply. After that, he exhausted all his appeals. In 2011, Jan Arden talked about her brother's incarceration on a talk show. She said she has slowly been watching her brother die behind bars. He was always sick and he had sores that would never heal. She thought he had served his time and deserved to be released. In 2016, Vancouver lawyer Brock Martin and law students at the University of BC's Innocence Project filed a 267-page submission to the Minister of Justice. They claim that Ray is a victim of a miscarriage of justice. They examined the 41 pieces of evidence which the prosecution said were the threads that created a fabric that proved DeRay was guilty. In response, they wrote, A series of threads stitched together will give the appearance of a strong and resilient fabric. But on closer inspection, with only a little tugging on the fabric, the threads unravel. Almost every thread evaluated individually is suspect and weak. What is left is far from a reliable and sturdy garment and it cannot be trusted. They contend that the police had DeRay as a suspect from the very beginning and they developed tunnel vision. One big problem with the case was that in February 2003, nine years after the trial, a low-ranking officer took the evidence to a sawmill and burned it. The Crescent Police later said that this was a routine procedure. DeRay said that he believes that the police would have done anything to ensure the conviction stuck to him. One of the most significant problems Marlin and the students found was with the oil can that was found near Marshall's body. It was flat and appeared to be old. Two years before the murder, the company started adding a sticker to their bottles. The bottle that was found didn't have the sticker. 
so the bottle could have been there for years. Another problem was the tire track analysis. The analysis was performed by an employee of a tire store who was also DeRay Richard's roommate. He was the one who put the tires on the car. Before he testified, he was hypnotized. Also, in the years since the trial, it's been proven that visually examining tire tracks is not a scientifically accurate way to analyze tire tracks. Forensic experts in tires require years of training and education. Also, the distance between the center of the tire tracks and the snow was 6.2 feet. The distance between the center of DeRay's tires was only 5.2 feet, which is a difference of a foot. Also, the DNA testing said that the blood could have belonged to 1 in 12 people, which has only been used once in court to support a conviction. That was DeRay Richards' case. There was also the jailhouse informant. The details he gave did not match the evidence of the crime scene. There was also evidence that was ignored. 183 strands of hair, including pubic hair, were found on Marshall's body. None of it belonged to DeRay. No further testing was done on the hair, and the hairs were destroyed with the rest of the evidence from the case. After receiving the submission, the Justice Minister said he would review the case. But in October 2018, over 25 years after DeRay was convicted, he was permitted to leave the prison to visit family. Then in June 2020, before a decision was made on the case, DeRay was granted day parole. So he was released to a halfway house. It's believed at this time that DeRay Richards is still on parole. He still maintains that he did not kill Carrie Marshall. Number 2. Terrence Howard Terrence Howard was born in March 1969 in Chicago, Illinois to Tyrone Howard and Anita Williams. For a short time, the family lived in Cleveland, Ohio. After his parents' divorce, he moved to Los Angeles, California with his mother, who wanted to pursue an acting career. Terrence also had a passion for acting. He got the acting bug from his great-grandmother, Minnie Gentry. Minnie lived in New York City, and Terrence spent the summers with her. Minnie mostly worked as a stage actress, but she did have minor roles on television shows and movies like All My Children, The Cosby Show, Bad Lieutenant, and Law and & Order. After high school, Terrence moved to New York City to attend the Pratt Institute, but he didn't graduate. He said they studied chemical engineering, but this has never been verified. He eventually committed himself to acting. His first television role was on The Cosby Show, but his role ended up being edited out. When Terrence found out, he confronted the creator and star of the show, Bill Cosby. This was the start of Terrence's reputation for being difficult to work with. Terrence's breakout role was playing the oldest member of the Jackson 5, Jackie Jackson, in the 1992 ABC miniseries, The Jacksons, An American Dream. This led to guest spots on shows like Coach, Family Matters, and Picket Fences. In 1995, he landed a role as a secondary character in the film, Dead Presidents. That same year, he had a supporting role in the drama, Mr. Holland's Opus. Terrence thought that these two movies would land him roles as a lead actor, but they didn't and he continued to find work as a supporting actor, so he quit acting for a while. He moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and worked as a carpet cleaner, but he couldn't shake the acting bug and decided to pursue the career again. He got roles in movies like Big Mama's House, Hearts War and the notoriously bad Mariah Carey vehicle, Glitter. But 2004 proved to be a breakout year for Terrence. He had a supporting role in the Academy Award winning movie, Ray. He also had a notable role in the ensemble cast of Crash, which won the Academy Award for Best Picture. 
In 2005, Taryn started as a pimp and aspiring MC in Hustle and Flow. He was nominated for Best Performance by an Actor in a Leading Role. He lost to Philip Seymour Hoffman in Capote. From there, Terrence Howard has gone on to have a steady acting career with roles in films like Four Brothers, Iron Man, Red Tails, and Sabotage. His most notable role of late is starring in Fox's music drama, Empire. Terrence's career has also been marked with personal problems. This includes allegations of spousal abuse. His second wife filed two restraining orders against him. In 2015, Terrence admitted to hitting his first wife in an interview with Rolling Stone. The darkest story from Terrence's life happened when he was just a toddler and living in Cleveland, Ohio. In December 1971, John Fitzpatrick was 36 years old. He lived in Euclid, a Cleveland, Ohio suburb. He had four children and his wife was seven months pregnant. John was university educated and a second lieutenant in the army. After the army, he got a job as a salesman with U.S. Steel Corp. In the winter of 1971, he was having a house built in the suburbs. This would be his family's last Christmas in their Euclid home. On December 21st, John and his wife decided to take their kids to Higby's department store in Cleveland to see Santa Claus. John stood in line with his three youngest children while his wife and eldest child did some shopping. In line, they encountered 21-year-old Tyrone Howard, his wife, and their three sons. One of them was two-year-old Terrence. In many ways, Tyrone Howard was the opposite of John Fitzpatrick. Tyrone dropped out of high school and had problems holding down jobs. He hadn't worked in months because he had injured himself at a warehouse job. He had tried to join the army, but he was rejected. As they stood in line, several people, including John, accused Tyrone of butting in line. John and Tyrone started arguing, and both men used obscenities. There are different accounts as to what happened next. Some witnesses said that John used racial epithets. One witness said that John said, that's a cheap trick you pulled, buddy, that's going to set your race back five years. Then John and Tyrone got into a physical fight. John supposedly threw a punch, and Tyrone kicked him. John got Tyrone pinned against the wall. He supposedly kneed Tyrone in the groin, and he started bleeding because of an earlier injury. Then Tyrone started stabbing John in the thigh and the neck with a bladed tool. It's unclear what the tool was or where it came from. Some people claim that they saw Tyrone pull a knife from his coat. Other people, including Tyrone, said it was a nail file. A woman supposedly handed it to Tyrone. After John was stabbed, he fell to the ground. Tyrone stood over John and said it was self-defense so he would stay until the police arrived. Tyrone then said he hoped that he didn't die. Before the police got there, Tyrone ran away. 36-year-old John Fitzpatrick was stabbed six times. He did not survive his wounds. The instrument that was used to stab John was never found. Tyrone Howard was arrested the next day and charged with second-degree murder. His trial started on May 30th, 1972. Tyrone said that he had acted in self-defense. The trial lasted six days. The jury deliberated for 14 hours over two days. Tyrone was found guilty of the lesser charge of manslaughter. He was sentenced to one to 20 years in prison. Tyrone served 11 months and he was paroled on good behavior. In 2004, Terrence Howard was on Oprah promoting the film Crash and he talked about the incident. He claimed that it was racially motivated. He said that his father had lighter skin. 
At some point, he let his mother and brother join them in line. Taryn said that John Fitzpatrick asked him why he let those N-words cut in line. Tyrone said that was his wife and kids. Then they started fighting. After the interview aired, Tyrone spoke to a reporter with the Cleveland newspaper, The Plain Dealer. He explained that he was letting his wife in line, and people, including John Fitzpatrick, didn't know it was his wife. They thought he was letting her cut in line. John said something to her, and Tyrone told him that if he had anything to say, to say it to him and leave his wife out of it. John said that was a cheap trick, buddy. Then they started fighting. Tyrone was quoted as saying, It was nothing racial that went down. It was two men standing there, both of us acting like damn fools, instead of one of us taking the man's role and walking away. In 2019, Terrence Howard announced that he was retiring from acting. But, according to IMDb, he appeared in four movies in 2020 and 2021. He also has five movies and one TV show to be released in the next few years. Number 1. Woody Harrelson Woodrow Harrelson was born in Midland, Texas in July 1961 to Charles and Diane Harrelson. When Woody was seven, Charles abandoned the family. In 1973, Diane moved her three sons to her hometown of Lebanon, Ohio. In high school, Woody started acting in school plays. After high school, he attended Hanover College in Hanover, Indiana. In 1983, he graduated with a degree in English in theater arts. He then moved to New York City looking for acting work. In 1985, he was an understudy for Neil Simon's play, Bloxy Blues. But that same year, Woody got the role that would change his life. That was playing the lovable but simple-minded bartender, Woody Boyd, on the NBC sitcom, Cheers. He joined the cast in season four, replacing the character, Coach, when the actor who betrayed him Nicholas Colastano died suddenly in February 1985. Woody appeared in 200 episodes of the hit sitcom. For his role as Woody, he was nominated for an Emmy Award five times. He won once in 1989 for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series. While appearing on Cheers, Woody made his way into movies. His first film role was the 1986 sports comedy Wildcats starring Goldie Hawn. His first starring role in a movie was 1992's White Men Can't Jump. The following year, he starred alongside Demi Moore and Robert Redford in the erotic drama Indecent Proposal. In 1994, Woody starred in Oliver Stone's controversial Natural Born Killers. In 1997, he was nominated for the first time for an Academy Award for playing pornographer and free speech advocate Larry Flint in The People vs. Larry Flint. He lost to Jeffrey Rush in Shine. In 2010, Woody was nominated for another Academy Award Best Supporting Actor for his role in the military drama The Messenger. Once again, he lost. This time, it was to Christoph Waltz in Inglorious Bastards. He was nominated for a third time in 2018 for the crime drama Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri. He lost to his Three Billboards co-star, Sam Rockwell. During his nearly 40-year career, Woody Harrelson has starred in movies and television shows in almost every genre. He's appeared in small, independent films like Trans-Siberian, Defender, and Rampart. He's also appeared in mega blockbusters like the Zombieland movies, the Hunger Games franchise, War for the Planet of the Apes, and Venom, Let There Be Carnage. Another one of his most notable roles, for which he received another Emmy nomination, was playing Detective Marty Hart in the first season of True Detective. 
However, this time he lost to Brian Cranston for his role as the high school science teacher turned meth kingpin Walter White in Breaking Bad. It was the fifth and final time Cranston won for the role of Walter White. While Woody Harrelson has had an amazing career and is one of the most famous actors in Hollywood, there is a very dark chapter in his family's history book. His father, Charles Voight Harrelson, was born in July 1938 in Lovelady, Texas. He started off selling encyclopedias in California, but then he became a professional gambler. In 1960, Charles was convicted of armed robbery. He was sentenced to five years in prison, but he only served several months. At some point after this, he became a contract killer. In the late 1960s, 31-year-old Alan Harry Berg was an executive in his family's carpet business. On May 28, 1968, Alan was lured to a bar by a woman who promised him sexual favors. After that, he disappeared. Alan's remains were found a few months later on November 8, 1968 on a deserted beach after a private detective received an anonymous tip. There was a bullet hole in his skull and a rope around his neck. Charles was arrested on November 20th, 1968. At this point, Charles was no longer with Woody's mother. He was living with his common-law wife. She was also arrested. It turned out that she was the one who told the private detective where to find the remains. She knew about the remains because she saw Charles kidnap and murder Allen Berg. He was supposedly murdered on the orders of a man named Frank De Maria. He supposedly paid Charles $1,500, which is about $12,000 in 2022. It's suspected that De Maria was angry at Allen's father, Nathan, who was his rival in the carpet business. Another motive was that Charles killed Allen over gambling debts. Allen supposedly owed De Maria $7,000. A month after Charles was charged with Allen's murder, he was charged with a second murder. On July 6, 1968, a month after Allen was killed, 30-year-old Sam DeGilia Jr. of Hearn, Texas went missing. DeGilia was a wealthy grain operator and father of four. His body was found five days later in a shack in McAllen, Texas. He had been shot twice in the head. The police discovered that DeGilia's lifelong friend and business partner, Pete Thomas Scamardo, was in to heroin distribution, but he had lost a shipment. To make up for the missing money, Scamardo took out a life insurance policy on his friend. He then paid Charles and 43-year-old Jerry Watkins to kill him. It was $2,000 per man for the hit, which is about $17,000 in 2022. Watkins and Scamardo were also arrested. Charles Harrelson went to trial in September 1970 for the murder of Alan Berg. The star witness was his former common-law wife who claimed to have seen the murder. She admitted that she was the woman who lured Alan to the bar. Charles' lawyer said that other people could have had motive for killing Alan. He said that Allen was known to hang out with gangsters. He also set up a front for gangsters to run gambling schemes in Galveston, Texas. The problem was that Allen liked to gamble and he wasn't very good at it. Charles' lawyer said that Allen double-crossed someone he shouldn't have and this is how he ended up being murdered. Charles' lawyer had two men testify that Charles was with them at the time of the murder. The jury deliberated for two hours and 40 minutes. Charles was acquitted on all charges. But after he was acquitted, he returned to jail to await his trial for the murder of Sam DeGalia Jr. That trial started in November 1971. The prosecution's star witness was Jerry Watkins. 
Hawkins took a plea deal and testified against Charles Escamardo in exchange for immunity. Escamardo was tried separately in March 1970, months before Charles went to trial. He was found guilty of being an accomplice to murder. He was amazingly only given seven years of probation. At Charles' trial in November 1971, Hawkins said that he was the driver and he saw Charles suit to Gaglia. Charles' lawyer had a nightclub singer testify. She said she was with Charles when the murder happened. The trial lasted 23 days and the jury deliberated for 13 hours. They ended up being deadlocked, so a mistrial was declared. Charles went to trial again in July 1973. This time, the nightclub singer didn't testify because she was worried that she would be arrested for perjury. This time, the jury deliberated for six hours. Charles was found guilty of murder. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison. He had already served four years and nine months awaiting his trial. So he served another five years and he was released in 1978. But he was far from finished with his life of crime. John H. Wood Jr. was a U.S. District Judge. He had been given the name Maximum John because he liked to sentence people at the top end of the sentencing guidelines. He had a particular dislike for those involved in the drug trade because he thought it was the source of many of society's problems. On May 29, 1979, Judge Wood was getting ready to leave his home in San Antonio, Texas. He noticed that one of his tires was flat. As he examined the tire, he was shot in the back with a high-power rifle. He was dead within minutes of being shot. Judge Wood was the first American judge to be assassinated in over a century. Since Wood was known as a tough judge, there were a lot of possible suspects. But it wasn't long before a prime suspect emerged. A few months before the assassination, in February 1979, 33-year-old Jamil Shagra, who went by the name Jimmy, was arrested for drug trafficking. Jimmy lived in El Paso, Texas, and was considered one of the biggest marijuana smugglers in the United States. He was scheduled to go in front of Judge Wood, and he was looking at a life sentence. Instead, after Wood's murder in August 1979, Jimmy went in front of another judge and he was sentenced to 30 years without parole. But instead of going to jail, Jimmy jumped bail and vanished. He was arrested six months later in Las Vegas, Nevada. He was sent to Leavenworth Prison in Kansas. In 1980, Jimmy met career criminal Jerry Ray James he bragged about having Woods killed. James agreed to wear a wire and record their conversations. Around this time, Charles Harrelson was dealing with a serious addiction to cocaine. He was out on bond while awaiting trial for possession of cocaine, a gun, and loaded dice. On September 1st, 1980, Charles was driving east of Van Horn, Texas. He was suffering from drug-induced paranoia. He pulled off the interstate to examine the muffler, which was rattling. He attempted to fix it by shooting it with a 44 Magnum. Instead, he shot the tire. While holding the gun in his hand, he tried to hitchhike. No one picked him up, but several people called the police. When the police arrived, Charles pointed the gun at his head. This led to a six-hour standoff. During the standoff, he confessed to killing Judge Wood. He also said he assassinated John F. Kennedy. The standoff finally ended when a friend of Charles convinced him to surrender. Not long after Charles was arrested, his lawyer passed on some information to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Charles knew that one of the judge's tires was slashed before the shooting. This information had never been made public. 
Investigators continue to investigate Jimmy Shagra and his family. Jimmy's brother, Joe, was a lawyer. And investigators thought he was involved in his brother's drug business. The investigators started recording the brothers' conversations in the prison meeting room in October 1980. During the conversations over the next several months, Jimmy talked to Joe about the assassination of Judge Wood. This included hiring Charles Harrelson to carry out the hit. The FBI investigated the murder of Judge Wood for years. And finally, in April 1983, five people were indicted for the murder of Judge Wood. They were Jimmy Shagra, his wife Elizabeth, and his brother Joe, along with Charles Harrelson and his wife, Joanne Harrelson. Jimmy and Joe were accused of paying a quarter million dollars to Charles, which is the equivalent of just over a million dollars in 2022, to murder the judge. Jimmy's wife was accused of delivering the payout, while Charles' wife was accused of buying the rifle. Joe ended up making a plea deal. In exchange for his testimony, he pleaded guilty to conspiracy and he was given a 10-year sentence. However, there was a caveat. He would testify against everyone, but his brother. Joanne Harrelson went to trial first in November 1981 for buying the rifle. When she registered to buy the rifle, she used the first name Faye and the last name King, which reads, Faking. She was found guilty of giving a false name and address when buying the gun. She was sentenced to three years of prison. But this was only the start of her legal problems. Charles, Joanne, and Jimmy's wife, Elizabeth Shagra, went to trial in September 1982 for a conspiracy to commit murder and obstruction of justice. There was 40 days of testimony. The jury deliberated for 18 hours over three days. All three were found guilty. Before they were sentenced, Jimmy Shagra went to trial. His trial lasted a month. A notable difference between his trial and the trial of the other three was that Joe Shagra didn't testify. The jury deliberated for 20 hours over four days. They found Jimmy not guilty of murder. But he was found guilty of obstruction of justice, tax evasion, and possession of marijuana. A month after Jimmy's trial, Charles Harrelson was given two life sentences plus five years. His wife, Joanne, was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Elizabeth Shagra was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Jimmy Shagra, the supposed mastermind, was only sentenced to 15 years in prison. Joe Shagra served six and a half years in prison. In 1996, at the age of 50, he was killed in a car accident. Jimmy later admitted to being the mastermind of the murder, hoping that his confession would get his wife released early. But that didn't happen. Elizabeth died at age 41 of ovarian cancer in 1997 while behind bars. Joanne Harrelson was released from prison in 1997. According to a newspaper article, she has died since then. Although Charles Harrelson was acquitted of the murder of Allenberg, he later confessed to it. He later boasted that his body count was as high as 50. An associate said he may have been involved in 50 murders, like being the driver, but he didn't kill that many people. He said that Charles killed six people at most. There are even conspiracy theorists who say that Charles was involved in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Woody Harrelson said his dad was never around much when he was a kid. In 2012, he talked to The Guardian about when he first heard about his father being in legal trouble. He said, I was 11 or 12 when I heard the name mentioned on a car radio. I was in the car waiting for a lady who was picking me up from school, helping my mom. Anyways, I was listening to the radio and it was talking about Charles V. Harrelson and his trial for a murder. 
and blah blah blah. And I'm sitting there thinking, there can't be another Charles V. Harrelson. I mean, that's my dad. It was a wild realization. In 1988, in an interview with People Magazine, Lee said that he visits his father in prison once a year. In 1997, Charles tried to get a new trial and Woody paid for his legal expenses, but he ultimately lost his appeal. In March 2007, 68-year-old Charles Harrelson was found dead in a cell in ADX Florence Supermax Prison in Colorado. The cause of death was a heart attack. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.